So I'm calling this uh, presentation a progress report since NanoScientific 2019. And I'd like to uh, really thank uh, Park Systems for offering this platform, uh, which is uh, quite unusual for nanotechnology fields to uh, feature uh, these uh, studies on climate change. Uh, but hopefully I think it's a reflection of the, uh, the foresight of the leaders of this company uh, of the importance uh, of ensuring that humans have a habitat so that, uh, uh, but in the end, like people in technology who are working to make a better future and ensuring that we have a livable future, I think is priority. So since uh, two years, uh, many things happened in the world. We have experienced COVID and uh, unfortunately, like uh, nature is uh, degrading and the Amazonian forest has become a net carbon source in many uh, uh, portions of its uh, territory. And we have just recorded the hottest month on record in global history. And greenhouse gases are soaring, and especially the rate of methane in the atmosphere has been increasing uh, at a record rate. And uh, in this past talk, um, we mentioned that direct air capture is a no-go. It's essentially not feasible from fundamental uh, physical uh, constraint perspectives. But despite the warning we gave, uh, there is still a fascination and a myth uh, in the general public discussions uh, and thinking that's a, a part of the solution. And uh, most of the uh, material science and engineering community has uh, still remained oblivious to the warnings and have continued business as usual. And uh, currently existing solutions are uh, still working on something that will not really directly address the climate uh, process as we'll highlight again today. And the world has been on track to a ecological and a societal collapse by the year 2050 at the latest. It has been subjected to by human uh, uh, impact through greenhouse gas forcing is on this uh, gray arrow line. And we're on track to traversing many boundaries, especially the thermal boundaries. And uh, we'll be uh, hitting like two degrees Celsius, three degrees Celsius, and even four or five before the uh, intrinsic uh, CO2 content of the atmosphere or oceans become actually toxic or dangerous to ecosystems. So to boil this down to a more easy to understand, perhaps one dimensional uh, diagram view, we're essentially on track to breaching the thermal boundary way before we'll be uh, impacting, impacted by the intrinsic CO2 toxicity. And in this view, uh, the only problem that we need to be focused on right now is to address this uh, overheating, which then can induce a range of downstream impacts like extreme weather and ecosystem uh, degradation. So in terms of uh, like thinking uh, you know, on larger scale as engineers, what we need to do is to imbue the earth system they, uh, with the ability to move in the negative temperature direction. And actually you can take any route you wish, either to the left or to the right, or even to the very right, as long as you do not reach uh, roughly 1,000 ppm, we're just fine. But the important thing is to achieve a negative temperature uh, mobility. And uh, two years ago, we pointed out that uh, uh, while renewable energies are important and we should continue to work on them, we shouldn't think that just becoming renewable will solve the climate uh, problem because they all they do is to uh, stop increasing CO2 very quickly and the, to slow down the rate of warming. But intrinsic uh, you know, climate and the dynamics of the system is such that there is already baked in warming of the order of one to two degrees Celsius that's still in the system. So even if we uh, achieved 100% renewables, the earth will continue to heat due to its intrinsic dynamics. So we shouldn't be relying on renewables as the panacea for the climate crisis. So uh, since two years ago, there's been quite a few key uh, publications that I'd like to highlight. One is that uh, large areas of the world will become inhabitable and the uh, ecosystem will collapse due to thermal and extreme weather events uh, starting essentially around the 2020s and gradually moving to uh, large parts of the tropical world by the middle of the century or before. And uh, there's also, this study, which seems to suggest that the, the much talked about insect apocalypse in the literature might be thermally, thermally induced. 
So on the right here, we see the change or degradation of uh, biomass for bumblebees in different parts of Europe and North America. And places that underwent the most severe degradation are locations where we also experience the most heating. And interestingly, in locations uh, where there seems to be cooling the population of bees, uh, in some instances, it uh, actually seems to rebound. So there seems to be a really good correlation to the temperature trend. And these authors even conclude in their abstract that um, these effects are independent of land use, which is often cited as a reason for biodiversity loss. And a recent talk by Ariel from Cornell shows that uh, total factory productivity in agriculture has been decreasing by about 20 to 30%. So as we predicted in 2019, uh, and it's still true, um, agriculture is a weak link for human systems and it's uh, really suffering as a result of multiple factors. Uh, mean one include climate change and soil degradation due to industrial agriculture. And of course, in the news, it's hard to not hear about climate change uh, almost on a daily basis these days. And many industrialized nations are starting to be uh, really hard hit uh, by these extreme weather events. So hopefully the public are becoming, is becoming more aware of the problem. So since uh, 2019, we also have made uh, some advances both at, in how we present the problem and in uh, some experimental specifics, which we will not discuss. So first of all, I think this particular diagram is particularly useful for understanding the basic uh, uh, bare bones mechanism of global warming. So these are node diagrams with uh, arrows denoting uh, uh, source and sink fluxes. So we have uh, two nodes to pick here. One is the total amount of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. The other is uh, a node representing how much heat is trapped on planet Earth. What happened since we started to burn coal is that we increased the source rate of greenhouse gases. And when you have an unbalanced source and sink, over time, the size of this particular node will increase. We don't need to worry about the specific coupling between greenhouse gas total concentration and uh, the sink rate of infrared radiation from Earth, but suffice it to say, it's equivalent to a spring-loaded valve. So a larger node will compress the spring valve and reduce the rate at which uh, infrared, re infrared radiation can escape. And now, once again, we have an unbalanced source and the sink rate leading to a growth of the size of this node, basically overheating on planet Earth. And that's basically a very simple diagrammatic depiction of what's happening on Earth. So we can also use the same diagram to understand uh, multiple mitigation strategies or concepts. And essentially we have four different knobs, RS, RK for greenhouse gases and for the heat. Some are direct knobs because they directly address the central problem, which is overheating. And others are indirect knobs because they do not tackle the actual problem, but try to do so through tuning other factors that's uh, mechanistically coupled to the actual problem. Renewable energy, carbon capture sequestration, all are acting on the source rate for uh, greenhouse gases and are trying to make this smaller. And carbon capture methods from the air are trying to increase the sink rate. And the geoengineering uh, protocols in general are trying to reduce the source rate of heat. And the mere reflection framework that we develop are actually trying to target multiple of these in a coherent engineering framework. And, but we certainly favor um, targeting RS because that's where we can have the most leverage on the system, as we'll explain later. There's also a way to uh, use uh, material science engineering to increase the rate of infrared radiation escaping from the earth, but we will not focus on that in this talk. It's uh, nice to appreciate what we're up against in some uh, diagrammatic depiction. Uh, first of all, let's just put some numbers on the problem we're confronting. And we can look at the problem from both a mater material quantity perspective or an energy or power uh, magnitude perspective. And it is useful to use large uh, units in this line of work. And Terra is 10 to the 12th. 
So we have an excess of about three teratons of CO2 equivalent in the uh, atmosphere in the oceans. In comparison, that's roughly uh, 10,000 times human biomass. In terms of the energy imbalance, essentially, what's the heating power that's currently driving warming? We have a number around the 430. But if, say, we were to um, stop all pollution and to lose um, the uh, cloud seeding anthropogenic aerosols, then the total energy imbalance can go as high as 1,000 terawatt. Uh, in comparison, uh, human civilization consumes 18 terawatts, which means the problem that's out there is 50 times larger, roughly, than the entire technical power that's available to humans. So here is a definition of the problem from the perspective of uh, matter. And for each person depicted as this, this tiny dot, you have this much more mass uh, CO, in terms of CO2 that you each of you have to address. Let's assume that you were somehow able to capture uh, amount of CO2, uh, the weight of your body weight. You have to work for 40 years in order to solve the problem. From energy perspective, each person has about uh, this much thermal power at your disposal averaged uh, on a per capita basis over the globe. But your share of the global warming that's driving Earth's warming is much, much larger, 50 times larger. So what makes a solution feasible? Essentially, it's an engineering problem. So we have to answer yes to all the following. First of all, it has to work in principle. And we have to have enough material on Earth to implement uh, the solution at scale and enough energy to do so, and to do so in sufficiently, uh, sufficiently quickly so that we have time to resolve the problem before it's uh, completely out of control. So let's then visualize uh, this uh, analysis using the example of a reforestation and afforestation. The total uh, afforestation and reforestation potential in the world is a very small fraction of how much greenhouse gas that's out there. And in order to capture that gas uh, in the form of wood uh, by growing forests and you know, at the same time sacrificing agriculture, it takes on the order of 100 to 200 years to fill those sinks. So essentially in the very optimistic case that we stop all emissions, we will still be left with a comparable problem 100 to 200 years down the road. What about capturing carbon industrially? Well, we have to make these orbits. And currently, um, if we want to capture our just current annual emissions, we need to increase the production capacity by these orbits by more than two orders of magnitude on average. And that's not the only challenge. The real challenge is that the energy required to make these orbits are on the same order of magnitude and sometimes exceed the total fossil fuel thermal power that we have available. And uh, to run these processes uh, at the scale that cancels annual emissions, we also need an additional amount of power which is comparable to what we have as a civilization. You can perhaps run the processes more uh, efficiently using renewable energy or more efficient forms of thermal energy such as heat pumps. But in much of the world today, due to the energy structure, it's still very difficult to even break even. So essentially, you would be running a process which creates its own additional demand in material and energy, but not really solving the root problem. And the same thing goes for um, additional material consumption. Basically, if we want to capture 1% of current emissions, we need to increase uh, material demand and environmental degradation by roughly on the order of 1%, sometimes more. So uh, by this metric, it seems like our air capture is not a feasible candidate to consider. So essentially, we have examined by these criteria that it, uh, the mainstream um, proposals of renewable energy, nature, and technical ways to draw down are not uh, solutions at all. And in fact, there doesn't exist a single proposal in the mainstream discussions that could even in principle halt the climate catastrophe. And that's where mere reflection comes in. 
So the basic idea is that rather than think of CO2 in the air as just evil, let's uh, think more multidimensionally. CO2 has many different impacts uh, on the environment, one of which is the heating of the plan planet through the greenhouse gas effect. But also, it has a CO2 fertilization potential uh, benefit on land plants and uh, aquatic plants. And it also helps land plants to use water more efficiently by enabling uh, the leaves and the stomata in the leaves to close uh, and still get enough influx of CO2. And in doing so, water evaporation becomes less uh, severe. So if there's a way to selectively cancel out the heating uh, detriment, but retain the CO2 fertilization potential, then we can buy time to uh, transition to a re more renewable civilization. So how do we do that? The idea is to use glass mirrors to cancel out the heating effect of CO2 by closing down the valve, the inlet for heat, which is in the form of shortwave radiation. And we have done uh, economic assessment of the uh, process. And the price for canceling out one ton of CO2, the warming effect, it should be somewhere between one and 10 US dollars. Uh, assuming it's conducted on a global governmental level where it only costs consists of material and energy use and transportation and the human labor. So cooling mirrors when installed outside will help us to ramp down fossil fuels. First of all, it provides this cooling effect such that losing the aerosols from burning fossil fuel wouldn't induce any warming. Because uh, we know from experiments that after COVID hit, uh, stopping air flights uh, has led to an increased um, solar radiation reaching the Earth. This was data recorded in the Netherlands. And uh, last year, shortly after COVID, they uh, recorded the record high uh, amount of sun uh, reaching the ground and with consequent warming. And a clear sky will also favor a bunch of uh, concentrating solar thermal energies, renewable energies, and making also photovoltaics more efficient. And that in turn will make ramping down fossil fuel much more easily. So it's a, a synergistic with renewable energies. And the uh, cooling um, environment will favor sustainable agriculture because you don't need as much water. And ecosystem will be able to recover because heat will be less damaging, there'll be less heat. And eventually a better environment will enable uh, better uh, efficiency for natural solutions and the sustainable agriculture to act as slow sinks, but steady sinks for a greenhouse gas in the atmosphere. So we have assessed the potential for cooling uh, in different locations of the world, and you can achieve uh, optimal cooling by adjusting angle of the mirrors. And over much of the world, we can achieve around 100 watt per meter squared of cooling. And here is a, a similar simulation, but uh, sort of like a bottom up, looking at the radiant transfer of a collimated ray of sunlight going through the atmosphere and become uh, somewhat scattered in direction in the uh, azimuthal and polar axis. And when this light um, interacts with the mirror and it goes out of the atmosphere, uh, it roughly 70 to 80% of the power is ejected into uh, empty space. So how does MIR help us to defeat this climate uh, thermal mon monster? So with this little power that you have, what we can do is to use this heat to make mirrors. And when mirrors are installed outside, they will continuously um, eject solar energy and preventing the heating of Earth. And when this process is integrated over a year, this is how much uh, thermal power equivalent that would have been ejected by the mirror produced by this much thermal energy you have. And there we see uh, this uh, dramatic amplification is the reason why we can vanquish something that's much larger. Conceptually, uh, the process of using mirrors is to reduce a three-dimensional problem to a two-dimensional uh, process, because instead of having to filter the atmosphere and oceans, we now only need to prevent heat conversion at the 2D surface, thereby rendering a previously impossible problem to something that's manageable from engineering perspectives. So now let's quickly go through the experiments conducted with these colleagues. So we tested just a very small array of two mirrors, one uh, 
lying to the east, the other to the west. Here are the temperature variations of soil at 10 centimeter depth for one uh, under one of the mirrors compared to a control field. And we see there's a dramatic difference already. Even at 25 centimeters, we can see uh, a measurable difference. We can analyze the signal and the uh, uh, band pass at so uh, day minus one frequency. And we see uh, we fit the data to uh, just exponential decay uh, in soil depth. And uh, see that um, for different uh, perturbations, the uh, decay constant for this um, rather high frequency component uh, in this field um, is roughly, uh, it has a decay constant of 0.08 8 or 9 uh, per centimeter inverse, per centimeter. And uh, the anomaly is the difference between uh, temperature in the perturbation field and the control field. And that uh, we see spikes uh, at around noon of each day. The same process can be applied to analyze uh, the anomaly data. And uh, the depth dependence is still uh, quite comparable to the actual temperature fluctuations. And uh, we can also analyze uh, what's uh, driving the process by looking at uh, the components of solar irradiance at uh, uh, day minus one compared with uh, the temperature anomaly measured uh, band pass at the same uh, frequency. So we basically uh, phase align the two data sets and the co-plotted the, the result of the envelope and show that there is a very uh, direct correlation between the solar irradiance that's driving the passive cooling and the cooling that's actually observed. And the two different mirrors show slightly different, uh, but uh, comparable and consistent uh, cooling trends. And the result doesn't change significantly when we include, uh, include a wider bandwidth of data from like uh, around five day to roughly one day uh, variabilities. So what can we, uh, how can we use this data set uh, to project the impact on different parts of the world, say, and different parts of uh, the United States? Well, we can observe that instead of using solar irradiance, which is the primary driver for the uh, experiment, we can also look at uh, uh, correlation with diurnal temperature variation. And this parameter has been uh, very well characterized uh, for different locations. And here's a map for the United States. So in New Hampshire, we have an average uh, of around 10 degrees Celsius or 20 degrees um, roughly at Fahrenheit as depicted by this green and yellow color. So in uh, regions that are especially drought stricken, we think the impact should be larger uh, by a combination of uh, this correlation, but also uh, due to the fact that soil might be less moist, therefore having a smaller heat capacity and therefore any difference would be more uh, dramatic. So in summary, mirrors are much better than forests in terms of uh, equivalent carbon offsetting potential on a per area basis. And uh, the difference is more stark for other type of forests, including planted uh, uh, agricultural crops, uh, monocultures. But if we talk about climate, climate benefits, the difference is much larger because forests are dark and they contribute to local heating. Same thing can be said about Arctic ice because uh, mirrors are, uh, they receive more sunlight when implemented in areas that's not the, uh, the Arctic. And we have also started to prototype uh, DIY projects for um, uh, Friday for future strikers. And we think that if all of them carried uh, a half meter squared mirror on their day of protest, they can together offset one megaton of CO2, uh, which is a uh, couple orders of magnitudes larger than current global capacity by industrial means. And in fact, it's much, much cheaper to just uh, do the offsetting using mirrors rather than to construct very expensive power plants. So with that, I'd like to thank uh, uh, Edwin H. Lent for his vision for constructing the Roland Institute, where I had the freedom to pursue this line of research and also all members of Mirror Reflection and our donors for supporting our work and our collaborators and uh, 
uh, divisors. Thank you.